Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for a webinar with Ed Livo from Virtual Nursery. I am Ann Shellman with the Master Gardener Program in Stanislaus County. Excited to bring you this webinar. I met Ed over 20 years ago when he was just pioneering the fruit bush method. And um, I was not familiar with UC Cooperative Extension at that time. And I did not know that Ed was working with Chuck Ingalls an advisor in Sacramento to perfect this method. And so there's so much great information that Ed has to share with us today. So thank you so much, Ed, and uh, let's get started. Well, good morning and um, sorry for the delay. I'm not sure what the technical difficulties were, but um, you know, always a challenge, always a challenge. But Anyways, this morning, uh, let me let me go do let me do something right here real quick. I'm uh, I'm speaking live from Virtual Nursery today, and uh, where I work as the sales and marketing director. Um, also, um, of course, run the uh, website uh, retail website called the Tomorrow's Harvest which is uh, also a virtual nursery um, retail site. And then uh, I have my own little Facebook page um, that um, is called Ed Able Solutions. And it uh, has all kinds of neat little videos on fruit pruning, just uh, anecdotal ideas on how to uh, um, grow fruit in your yard and enjoy fruit in your yard. So uh, I hope everybody... Uh, takes a look at uh, our sites and enjoys uh, some of the information that we have to share. So a little bit about, you know, my background. I've actually been in this industry uh, for roughly about uh, 45 years. Um, I've spent my time pretty much dedicated to um, uh, fruit trees. I come uh, kind of out of a fruit tree background. Uh, anyways, growing up in Connecticut around Macintosh apple trees and uh, taking them for granted as a kid. But uh, then, of course, uh, gradually growing up and then realizing that I really had an affection for uh, fruit and edibles and uh, started uh, working in the, what was coined the edible landscape um, realm uh, in, the, in the 1970s. Um, and then, um, then was able to connect with some incredible people like uh, Rosalind Creasy and, uh, and become more um, acquainted with the importance of having some sort of a, a system and an approach and, and, um, and really, you know, a goal uh, in uh, producing fruit uh, in a limited space in your yard. So um, uh, I, I actually started to explore uh, a lot of uh, these techniques uh, back in that day. Um, I was a part of a, a nursery called the Urban Tree Farm at the time up in Santa Rosa and working with some very, very brilliant people at that time and gaining some insight. Um, I started to practice what I was calling the butcher pruning method. And uh, so that butcher pruning method was uh, uh, my way of size control at the time. And it worked, um, it was successful. Um, after a, a short while, I went to work for a large company called the Dave Wilson Nursery and uh, brought some of my ideas to them. And at the time they kind of said, well, you know, Ed, we like, you know, the, the, your concepts and everything, but the idea of calling it butcher pruning is not quite what, you know, we think is gonna be marketable. Why don't you come up with a better idea? And so uh, I thought about it for a while and. I heard about all the different approaches to commercial orchard culture. And I thought, well, heck, you know, the opposite of commercial or, or the, not the opposite, but the equal of commercial orchard culture in the backyard would be a backyard orchard culture. And I, I, I kind of theorized that if in fact a nursery, I mean, a, 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 a orchard grower had the challenge of growing fruit trees in their own yard and that they had the limitations of the average homeowner that, you know, they would do some of the, or what what would they do to accommodate these situations and these challenges and, and kind of approached it that way. So mixed some commercial concepts, you know, with some um, kind of radical concepts of the time and that uh, came up with some, uh, some pretty simple basic ideas on fruit tree control and also rationalizations as to why you should practice, you know, um, uh, size control as well. So, 
the uh, we talk about backyard orchard culture. And really basically what backyard orchard culture is, is high density pruning and planting of fruit trees. And it, its basis is size control. And that size control is absolutely, you know, something that should be practiced. It is practiced in almost all rams, commercial um, and, and uh, home garden alike. But I, I don't think that we um, really embrace, you know, how much, um, you know, size control can be imparted, you know, on a fruit tree. And, you know, as Ann said, and I think in, in the um, lead up to the, uh, to the presentation today, um, the, the term fruit bush um, has been coined by a lot of people. And I appreciate that because in essence, you know, we are kind of doing that. We're taking what would typically be a, a large tree and, and we're bushing it out and making it, you know, more accessible. So, you know, the basis of, of high density planting and pruning um, would be uh, simply size control. So we'll kind of start out with, um, there's many different styles and techniques that exist for growing fruit trees. And um, I think the, the most important point about that would be that all are, are dependent on some sort of pruning, meaning that, you know, the commercial growers um, require you know, certain aspects of pruning to be able to take and grow their trees successfully. Um, we have plants uh, that require certain rejuvenation, you know, when they're grown, uh, which requires pruning to rejuvenate uh, new wood. Um, there's all sorts of reasons for pruning. Um, and so um, the dependent, the fact that we should be pruning um, becomes one of the primary um, basis of growing all fruit varieties. So the, the idea that there's anything that would eliminate uh, the need for pruning is kind of just not a part of, you know, growing fruit in the, in the, uh, in the um, uh, home garden. So, and one of the things that I've really focused on was rootstocks are never the sole means of size control, of controlling the size of any fruit tree. And specifically, uh, I'll get into that. And the, the, the fact is that, you know, we so often listen to some of the terminology used behind uh, rootstocks and, uh, and, and the idea of rootstock. And in the home garden, I find that the real only focus seems to always be on, you know, the, the word semi-dwarf, you know. So we'll discuss what the prime purpose of a rootstock is. And we'll also discuss about how tall semi-dwarf actually is um, in relation to, you know, what your challenges are um, in growing fruit trees in the home garden. So conventional pruning um, in, the, in the orchards have changed dramatically, you know, let's say in the last um, 20 years. And 20 years ago, I mean, conventional pruning really and, land, and uh, orchards were, you know, 15, 12 to 15 feet on center with aisles that were 15 feet and even up to 20 feet. And when you get in the walnuts, even bigger. Um, so lots and lots and lots of space in between all the trees and trees that were actually grown to, you know, enormous heights, full size. And, you know, their primary purpose, of course, were all valid. The, 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 uh, the um, orchard grower is commercial orchard growers looking for maximum yield. Um, they have to have uh, equipment access, you know, whether it be for uh, cultivation um, or whether it be for spray activity or for harvesting. Um, uh, they have to have rows that are wide enough to be able to access uh, machinery down those aisles. Other practical reasons that they that they would prune would be for maximizing airflow, so that uh, they get good air circulation in the in the orchard. Because you know the the density of an orchard uh, really cuts off air circulation, so you want your trees to to be open enough to allow good air circulation, good light penetration that actually helps in in uh, ripening fruit, getting things getting things ready for harvest, and of course then last uh, is disease control. Not last, but Actually, disease control would be another, you know, great reason uh, for uh, commercial orchards pruning. And typically, you know, the the uh, uh, centers now would be at least ten by ten. Uh, that's at the that, that's at the 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 tightest. 
although there's a lot of high density planting being practiced now in the commercial orchards around the state, whether it be for almonds or for peaches and nectarines and plums, um, uh, you look, you'll look and see even um, walnuts are being gr grown on much closer spacing than ever before. And I think that, you know, it's just the idea that um, one, uh, you get a yield sooner, a, a, or let's say a marketable yield sooner off of um, a higher density planting to start off with, um, you, cause you're talking about, you know, a, a return on your investment for commercial growers may not be for two to three years on stone fruit and, and could be, you know, quite a bit longer than that for things like uh, walnuts or pecans. And so consequently, the higher density, when you do get those first harvests allows for a greater um, uh, return on your investment earlier on. And so, you know, that's a big deal um, for commercial growers. So, and then along with that comes, of course, new techniques that are being applied um, in that uh, high density plantings for commercial growers. And if you go up and down 99 now, you can see all kinds of weird configurations that are being adapted into orchards uh, to try to accommodate um, these uh, new techniques for higher density um, planting and also the machinery around um, what um, or how to, how to harvest because labor is getting so high that they're looking at some of these higher density orchards to be able to take a machine harvest. So they're, they're testing. And I do emphasize testing. I don't think anybody commercially has it down to what exactly the technique that we're going to be using for any particular variety of fruit is yet. But there's a lot of different experiments going on out there. And if you go up towards Sacramento on 99 and see some of the olive orchards, you can see that they're, they're all what they call hedgerow now, and they're all pruned and, and um, harvested mechanically um, and with very, very um, adapted machinery that um, has changed the face of how olives is gr are, are grown in the state completely, let's say over the last uh, 25 years or 30 years. So, you know, because if, if you go up, you know, by um, Yuba City and see the olive trees uh, in the older orchards up there, you'll see these big, beautiful, old, gnarly olives that uh, were grown the convention, what was considered the conventional way at that time. So a lot of the high density techniques that were not in practice when I first um, uh, initiated the backyard orchard culture technique, techniques, which were probably around 1992, um, are now um, in full swing commercially. Lots of experimentation going on, lots of new ideas being implemented. So, and I'm sure that that'll continue. And I, I hope for some exciting future for com commercial growers in that regard as well. So, but in backyard orchard culture, yeah, we've got a, a there, there's a different concept. You know, the idea of, for backyard orchard culture is, is basically controlling the size of the tree in, in a limited space because, you know, we all know that the average backyard right now is um, uh, not, not that big. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the idea that you can actually grow a fruit tree in your yard for some is kind of um, kind of daunting. You mo almost would think, well, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get this this big old, even an orange tree or or a mandarin or something like that, you know, to fit in my you know in my smaller you know um, what would be considered more uh, typical landscape size today. So and and really when I started doing this, that's what I had in mind. We could see the trend going that smaller lot sizes were definitely going to be a part of, you know, growing fruit trees um, or the challenge of growing fruit trees as we move forward. And things like you know, genetic dwarf fruit trees, um, although you know, they, they're really neat and they're very, very, you know, beautiful in bloom. And But the, the fruit flavors were average at best. And so really being able to enjoy some of the, the great varieties of fruit that we've all come to know and love um, really was gonna be the challenge or being able to take advantage of some of the new exciting varieties of fruit coming from uh, today's breeders um, was definitely going to be 
a challenge. And so one of the one of the goals of backyard orchard culture was to address that that limitation and say, you know, can we accommodate um, trees in a limited space and give advice that actually the average person can uh, apply? And so that was really where we had started out doing most of our our testing. Now, I had done a lot of it before I came to the to uh, the Dave Wilson Nursery. Um, I had done a lot of work when I was at the urban tree farm in testing these concepts. And like I said, I was practicing what I was calling butcher pruning for the <laughs> for the sake of, uh, well, I was pretty much butchering the trees and keeping them low and keeping them fruiting. And then learning as I went along the, the ideas of how you do that um, in a systematic, some sort of systematic way that you could relate to, to people. And so we also, you know, increased the planting in limited spaces too. So for instance, you know, when, when it comes to being able to accommodate a fruit tree in these, in these um, limited spaces that we have to deal with, the next concept that was really, you know, daunting was, well, you know, I mean, how long do people think fruit produces for? And I think a lot of people believe that when they put a, uh, like a peach in their yard, that peach is going to give them fruit for, you know, literally a month or two or something like that. But, you know, in reality, you're lucky, you know, if you have a variety that actually has ripe fruit available for, let's say, over a month um, on uh, any particular variety of stone fruit. And mind you, there are exceptions to the rule. There are some you know, outstanding varieties of fruit that hang for long, long periods of time, especially when it comes to the plums. Um, there's really plum varieties that you can have that will actually hang fruit for months. But the fact is, is that in most cases, the amount of time that it takes uh, or amount of time that fruit stays ripe on a tree is very, very limited to within, say, a two to three week window at the most. And, and so really, I saw the idea that people would want more than one fruit tree also as a goal and a challenge for uh, creating uh, the ideal situation for growing fruit trees in the backyard. And so we, we went on the concept of, of successive ripening, that people would want a peach that ripens early, mid and late in the season and, and or would like you know a different variety, let's say have an early variety plum and a mid season variety peach and then a late season variety of apple in their yard um, or, you know, or, or you had the space for two or whatever, you know, we wanted to create these options that uh, would give the homeowner some versatility and being able to enjoy the concept of successive ripening, having fruit available all year round. I mean, throughout the ripening season, but in reality, in California, you literally can have fruit all year round. And in my yard, um, I live in Antioch, um, and in Antioch, I have fruit literally all year round. You know, right right now we're just we're picking lemons. My car car oranges are just about ready. Um, we just got done with pomegranates and figs. Uh, I think we pick, picked our last fig uh, last week, and we still have some of uh, uh, some sweet pomegranates left to pick. Um, and uh, the mandarins are ripening quickly. Uh, and like I said, car car will be next uh, to harvest in my yard. Um, so you, you literally can have fruit all year round in California. It's uh, it, don't tell anybody would just get more people wanting to move here. So, and then the other two concepts that I think really are, are complementary to the home gardener, and that is the ease of maintenance. You know, it, in fact, you know, if if in fact we were going to make the, the the statement that the ease that that maintaining a fruit tree size requires pruning, and really emphasize that, then we really were kind of saying, you know, fruit trees are not um, they're not easy. You know, they're go there's going to be some maintenance to them. So in size control, when you've limited the the size of your tree, you've also made it much much easier to accomplish. The maintenance that's required to the fruit tree as well. And that maintenance would include, you know, pruning it, which of course that's the basis that we're talking about, but also it would, it would include the um, idea of spraying it, okay, which is definitely um, required in some cases. Um, definitely it would um, uh, keep 
keep you able to be able to visually check for insects, pest problems uh, easier, um, which I'm real big on uh, what they call integrated pest management, which does a lot of, um, it has a lot of going through and uh, looking at your um, your gardens and your fruit trees to try to stay ahead and visually connect with um, outbreaks of pests or disease and uh, curtail them early on so that you keep yourself to the least toxic um, methods of uh, control um, and or so that you um, uh, allow for the least amount of possible damage. So I'm all about being out in the garden observing. I love to go out with a cup of coffee, walk around my yard and just look at things and just see how the heck they're doing and see, you know, if I run into any problems and then if I do just sit down to coffee, go run over, get whatever and take care of it and try to try to nip it real quick. And last, the ease of harvest. And the ease of harvest is a big deal because, you know, and it went, oh, and let me add one other element to the ease of maintenance. Ease of maintenance, definitely one important factor that people really neglect to do, especially on a full size tree, and that is thin. And thinning to me is almost um, as important as size control. And it's kind of one of those, uh, I think one of those challenges, one of those jobs that uh, the home gardeners have a lot of uh, trouble with simply because um, man, you got all that fruit, you're gonna knock, <laughs> you're gonna knock a bunch of that fruit off. But you know, to get good size on fruit, to get um, to cut down on the problem of of having disease related issues um, on your fruit um, or pest problems as well, thinning, you know, when the fruit is roughly about thumbnail size, uh, um, and getting it thin so that you got great spacing in between your fruit. You know, I like, I don't know if you all can see this because I can't see me seeing me. So, but that that's important as well. So how do I know if everybody's on board right now? Hi, Ed, what do you mean on board? Well, I just want to know I, because, you know, unlike, you know, like, past presentations I could see I know I know I'm so sorry you can't even see me but um this yeah. is awesome everybody's saying they are with you okay and, cool good all right and That's it is difficult to thin fruit it is like the hardest thing ever so yeah yeah and, yep. and and it is so important too so so when I'm looking at ease of maintenance boy one of the, there's a number of things that I really pruning of course being number one but thinning is almost number two and getting out and thinning that crop so that you get good size of fruit and so that you cut down the problems that are related to having too much fruit on a limb, you know, like breaking limbs and things like that. Um, though, those really are those, I think, things that are accomplished by a good thinning regimen, even in the spring. And I can tell you, you know, one of the, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges with thinning, even for me, is you know, you'll go out and thin one weekend and think you did a, just a, just a bang up job and man, you'll come back, you know, later on the week and you'll look and you'll go, holy Hannah, did I even get out here and thin this tree at all? So, I, I mean, I'm even you know, guilty of that. So I always think that I've thinned enough and then come back later and realize that nah, I could do a little bit better job and end up knocking off, uh, knocking off a little bit more fruit as well. So thinning for me has always been a, a real aggressive task um, that I try to take and stay right on top of. And, and the benefits, you know, are definitely outweigh the uh, amount of extra work that I have to put in to do it. The benefits and, are uh, outstanding. Yeah. And Ed, we did have one question come up that I think is pertinent for right now. And it's about espalier. Should you thin espalier fruit? Heck yeah. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everything, everything requires thinning. I mean, every type of fruit style, fruit tree growing style requires thinning and benefits from thinning. So I, I think, like I said, I think it's the second next to size control. I think it's the second most important thing that you do when you're growing fruit trees in the home garden. Like just keep in mind that, you know, commercially, absolutely thinning is right up on top of the list of what they do. And they when you go out and you watch commercial growers thinning, you, uh, yeah, yeah, you, uh, you, you better bring a, a, you know, like a pill because they, they really make people feel uncomfortable because they knock a lot of fruit out of their trees, but they benefit from 
you know, the great size, and they are looking for better, bigger sizes than we would be in the home garden. I'm, I'm not big on having giant fruit. So, I, you know, like I'm, on those years when I get light set and I get huge fruit, it's not always, I don't always consider that a reward. Um, I have a variety that I particularly like called the Burgundy Plum. I really like the Burgundy Plum because of its it's a great universal pollinator, including working well for pluots and um, something that we investigated years and years and years ago. I identified it as one of the best pollinators for flu pluots, as a matter of fact. But it also sets a tremendous crop every single year, it requires an aggressive amount of, of thinning, but it only still produces you know, a, a medium sized plum. And I love it. I mean, it's, it's just when it's at peak ripeness, you know, the burgundy plum is absolutely outstanding and great for jellies and or jams and great for any kind of applications you want to do with your, with your uh, plum and uh, one of our favorites. Uh, so, and with high density planting or backyard orchard culture, we're talking about planting trees as close as two foot on center, as opposed to 10 foot on center. So two feet on center actually sounds pretty daunting when you get down to it, but you know, we'll kind of go over what, what that really means. So one of the big challenges that I had when I first started endeavoring into promoting, you know, um, high density pruning and planting was really fighting the uh, idea that uh, rootstocks had anything to do with size control whatsoever. So typically, you know, with, with people's understandings of rootstocks, they only hear the word semi-dwarf and that conjures up some notions and I'll cover those notions. But what is the prime purpose of, of the rootstock of a fruit tree? Well, in essence, the prime purpose of a rootstock um, is uh, disease resistance and soil adaptation. So meaning the, the idea of grafting, you, you know, is uh, grafting fruit trees is kind of even new to California. If you look at the relative age of the California fruit growing industry, there were a lot of um, trees that were grown by seed, varieties were grown by seed um, and seedlings um, back in the uh, uh, turn of the century. Um, uh, everything in California was dry farmed uh, from the uh, 1840s uh, to the 1920s um, and the um, the there were there were varieties that were were grafted you know but not a lot of them like the Muir peach and the two most uh, popular canning peaches at the turn of the last century in California were the Lovell peach and the Muir peach uh, the Lovell peach is now the number one rootstock for um, growing uh, uh, standard sized fruit trees or has been one of the number one rootstocks for growing standard sized fruit trees. And the Muir peach now is one of the few peaches that can claim peach leaf cure, peach leaf um, curl, a high level of peach leaf curl resistance. And uh, the Muir peach uh, comes out of uh, both, both come out of Solano County, were discovered in Solano County um, back in the uh, late 1800s. And they've been around a long, 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 long time. But you know, the, the whole idea of rootstocks really took on as we started to take and branch out into more challenging soils, more challenging climates, started to deal with problems like um, oak root fungus, which is a big problem um, in the Central Valley, especially up north. Um, it can be a problem, you know, around um, uh, Sonoma County and uh, up around the, um, uh, as you go further north um, it, up the coast. So, um, and that's, uh, oak root fungus is a big deal. And that required, you know, a specific rootstock to be able to take on it. Uh, rootstocks for cherries to, um, to combat X disease and uh, some uh, soil adaptations that weren't occurring uh, because of the uh, heavier soils, cherries on, um, uh, on their own root or um, on uh, early rootstocks uh, just really weren't uh, compatible with heavier soils. And so they would die. They don't like poor drainage. And um, so new rootstocks came in to accommodate that. So the, the purpose of rootstocks really primarily is for the disease resistance and the adaptation to the soil that they're going to be planted in. Uh, nematodes, big, big problem, you know, for uh, the um, 
uh, commercial orchard growers of the Central Valley. And so uh, they need rootstocks like the all famous Nimagard, which um, is a rootstock that is primarily uh, utilized specifically because of its resistance to nematodes. So rootstocks come on board and um, they become very, very popular. And then at some point, somebody realizes that, heck, you know, these, uh, these rootstocks uh, don't get quite as, quite as tall uh, or the trees on these rootstocks don't get quite as tall as the uh, ones on these other rootstocks. Um, could we in fact call them semi-dwarf? Um, that's pretty much the way that came around. Marketing is so much a part of this. And don't get me wrong, um, I am a marketer. <laughs> and, and so I'll take credit for, or, or take the blame, whatever be the case. But my purpose in addressing that was because I thought the home gardener was getting really a raw deal in the representation of rootstocks because uh, we had taken on this word uh, the semi-dwarf as the sole representation of the word, and I didn't, just didn't buy that. So the other thing that that rootstocks are great for is for uh, a thing called procosity, and procosity is actually initiating earlier fruit, the ability of the plant to bear fruit sooner and bear a big load of fruit when it does, a, a higher volume of fruit when it does. And so precocity is always something that you know, the commercial growers would look for and say, you know, they would benefit for. So a lot of times, you know, you'll hear about a particular root rootstock that imposes earlier bearing on a particular variety or it, the fruit on that uh, particular variety gets bigger um, and, um, and, the, and the crop uh, is, is much, much greater. So um, precocity is always one of those things that a rootstock can be real beneficial for. And then last is high density planting. And, and, and the idea of, of growing trees in high density has been around for a long time. And it's primarily been a pro, uh, around uh, applied to uh, apple trees and pear trees for many, 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 many years. And, and a lot of the rootstocks that are really, truly semi-dwarfing rootstocks are really a, a, um, associated with apples more than anything else. Um, because um, I think there's been more attention paid because the, the, the apples are so universal worldwide. You know, they, there's varieties that do almost do well almost everywhere. And so, you know, I think apples have been really at the forefront of fruiting, of fruit fruit choices. And so there's been a lot of attention paid to how they're grown and 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 because where they're grown, they were needing um, to have more adapting rootstock. So high density planting, especially with apples, uh, really was a big deal. There, if you look over to the, let me see, if you're looking at this, it would be to your right, and you see the picture of the um, the picture in picture. That picture is actually a picture of the a, a project I did with the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, we worked on that project for many years and they wanted to grow fruit trees up in the high desert. And that pic, that small picture that you can see there, that picture in picture is a, is a picture of the soil and the soil we had to deal with. It was just so uh, saline, I mean, so full of salt, it wasn't funny. And really the whole recommendation really wasn't so much rootstock ad ad adaptation as much as it was creating a whole layer of soil on top which uh, actually became mulch. You know, we just mulched and mulched and mulched and mulched until we actually changed the um, characteristics of the soil in that project. Um, now, a lot of that um, project actually helps support, I believe, the Master Gardener program with uh, Bob Ross, I believe his name is. And he, um, he runs the Master Gardener program over there, B brilliant man. And um, I think they, they sell their fruit to the, uh, to the casinos. So it actually acts as a uh, revenue source, which is very cool. And then I, right below that, I include a little picture of high density apple growing, which uh, uh, you can find uh, examples of everywhere. And uh, the one picture that's adjacent to that is actually a uh, picture of precocity because this uh, variety called Gold Rush Apple, which I had the privilege of actually going on to the Oneida Indian Reservation uh, last week up in Wisconsin. And uh, I toured their orchards and all I saw were these, you know, uh, gold rush apples loaded. And uh, they were on a, um, um, I believe it was a mauling nine, um, a, a more precocious rootstock. 
other way. Well, this is typically where I get audience participation, but I don't know if that's going to work right now. <laughs> we can try, Ed. We can try. All right. Well, I'd like to know how tall does everybody think a semi-dwarf tree should grow? Oh, let's have everybody type it in the chat. How tall does a semi-dwarf tree grow? Let's see if we get some. Uh... Oh, we're getting a lot of answers. Uh... Good. 10 max, 15, 12 to 15, 6 to 8, 15 to 30, 25, 5 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. It's all over the board. Here. I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh -huh. Any height. It depends. These are great answers. 30 feet. That's it. it. It really does. Okay. Well, we did some studies. We did some tests to actually see what, um, what people really did think you know, of what, how tall a semi-dwarf rootstock should get. And even went by uh, category. So by apples, okay. So we took uh, the most popular apple rootstock, which is an M111 rootstock, okay. And we, we said, uh, how, how tall does the most popular semi-dwarf rootstock get, the M111? Well, it gets, its claim is 65% of standard. Well, the problem with that is, is that, well, you know, the, the uh, golden delicious apple is a, is a smaller tree and it can grow about uh, 20 so, so feet. So really, you know, with a semi-dwarf M111 rootstock, you can think it's probably going to go, say, 16 to 18 feet. But on the other hand, a Gravenstein apple can grow 40 feet tall. And so consequently, that means that that same Gravenstein apple is going probably over 30 feet. So on that same rootstock. So it's kind of deceiving in that, you know, here's the most popular variety of, of fruit tree um, and sold on semi-dwarf rootstock, but in actuality, it gets quite large. So we said, well, you know, are there any other examples that are like that? And we found that were nothing but examples like that. And one of the best was the Mahala rootstock which is a semi-dwarf, the most popular semi-dwarf rootstock for cherries, probably over the last um, maybe 40 years. And well, the Mahala rootstock is nefarious in that it dwarfs a uh, whopping 98% of standard, meaning the difference between a, a standard and the Mahala rootstock is what, 2%. So, how tall does a cherry get? Probably about 40 feet. So you can see that a cherry probably becomes a problem for most home gardeners who really think that that rootstock is really going to do the trick. They, they get, they get kind of buffaloed really, really quick. So what word comes to mind when you hear the word semi-dwarf? Because I really don't think it's the problem of the consumer. I just think that the, the marketing terminology kind of gets you, you know, kind of, it, it does, it kind of, it kind of fools you. So what, and so consequently, when you're dealing with semi-dwarf, the word semi-dwarf, it really conjures up other ideas. It really, it, it appeals to the, um, it, it appeals to not so much the, the, um, uh, the facts as it appeals to the idea, the vision, the, the, the um, I don't know, it's, it's, the, it, it, it's the, uh, the hope. So the big question is, aren't semi-dwarf trees low maintenance? Because I think that's really what people really feel when they when they are selecting a, se a semi-dwarf tree, they're thinking this is gonna be less work. And, and I think that that's the misconception because semi-dwarf is only a word. Um, it really isn't an action. And so in essence, you know, if, the I if it imparts the idea that you really don't have to do anything, then I think it, it creates some of the problems that the average homeowner deals with, the, uh, with their fruit trees. And, and I'll give you an example. You know, I've been in the nursery business a long, long time. And, and I started out in retail years. Well, I actually started out in landscape, but I, I actually then went to retail years ago. 
I'm working for a nursery up in <clears throat> Santa Rosa called the Urban Tree Farm, and it's a wonderful nurse retail nursery up there. It's still there. And um, what I found was customers would come in and they would say to me, you know, I bought a, I bought the Santa Rosa plum, you know, from that nursery down the street. And uh, man, that, you know, it was supposed to be a semi-dwarf and that dang tree, you know, it's already up to 10, 15 feet tall. And I, I'm really disappointed. And I would take them by the hand and say, yeah, I know that nursery down the street there. I, I, I get it. Let me, let me go ahead and show you what you should be buying. And I would take them in the back and show them fruit trees on the same rootstock that the that nasty nursery up the street had sold them and send them out the door like I was doing them a favor. Um, and in essence, um, I really I really wasn't. And, and it wasn't long before I made that connection and said, you know, th this is really something that has to be addressed uh, on a bigger uh, on a bigger level. So the answer to the question, aren't semi-dwarf trees low maintenance? No, they're not low maintenance. They're no less maintenance really than a tree on any rootstock. You know, the, the idea of, of controlling the size of your tree should be primary, not whether or not the rootstock, the physical things that are a part of that tree are actually um, going to contribute anything. You know, the main, the main objective of course, of course, with rootstocks is, are they going to grow in the soil that I plant them in? So in essence, back to the, back to the reason for rootstocks, you know, if in fact the tree is not going to live in the soil I planted in, it's going to die. That means it's permanently semi-dwarf. And, and I mean, if that's what you're looking for, then it is low maintenance, you know, because it's easier to maintain a tree that's not living. So my thought would be, you really have to approach the idea of how tall really, when people are telling you a size, how tall that size really is. So when somebody says, my fruit are these fruit trees only get 18 feet tall. That's 18 feet. So does anybody believe that that's semi-dwarf in the mind of what the word suggests? I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. I mean, that's 18 feet. That that right there says that you're on a ladder, you know, you're probably on a ladder that isn't even reaching the top of the trees. I love the people that like to feed the birds, but in essence, if you have a wonderful piece of fruit, the idea that you'll give up the top of the tree for the birds is not necessarily something that you're really happy about. You're just saying, well, it's out of my control. Well, it doesn't have to be. It's just that typically when somebody tells you that a rootstock is semi-dwarf, these trees only go 18 feet. I want you to remember this picture. You know, this picture says that's 18 feet. And if you think that that's, that's, that is actually almost, I think it's as tall as a two-story house. But there are some rootstocks that only go 12 feet, which 12 feet seems more reasonable. I, I would definitely say that. And I know what 12 feet is as well. So this is 12 feet. I would ask you if you, if you still think that 12 feet is, is what you really ideally would want your fruit tree to be. And I, I, think, I think it's still too tall. Yes, Ed, people are saying too tall. Right. So my fruit trees tend to be in the seven to eight foot range. Um, you can actually um, take a look at uh, any of the websites I've pointed out um, to go see some of the videos and you can see where I maintain my fruit trees. And uh, I, I, my fruit trees are, are as tall as I am with my hands extended fully above my head. So just raise up your hands like you're under arrest and that's how tall my fruit trees are. Tall people have tall trees. Short people have short trees. My trees are as tall as I am with my hands extended above my head. So I believe that's as tall as a fruit tree should be ever. 
And then I want all of you to be aware that this was uh, these pictures I cut out of a special video that was done at the Harvest Festival two years ago. Uh, and we talked nothing about uh, or nothing more than um, high density planting and uh, pruning of your fruit trees. It's a wonderful um, uh, video. And um, and definitely my friends up there at the uh, UC Master Gardeners of Sacramento County are a wonderful bunch to work with. They're, they're just outstanding and they do such a great job in terms of promoting concepts for the backyard garden. So let's talk about backyard orchard culture. And, and believe it or not, this, this is actually going to be a, a little bit easier than I think everybody would imagine, okay? Because that was the intent. So a lot of people have always asked me, well, why don't you write a book? And there have been a couple of books, you know, written. I think um, Anne Ralph wrote um, Grow a Little Fruit Tree. Um, Colby Ironman wrote um, uh, Backyard Growing of Fruit Trees. Um, both of them um, uh, cited, of course, these techniques. Um, as uh, techniques that you should use for growing. And then, uh, of course, we've got the um, UC pub, and I can't remember the number now, oh my gosh, um, that I, actually I had the privilege of helping to, to write, and um, that covers these techniques, I think, quite well. And are you well. talking about the uh, training and pruning fruit trees series? There's about four of them? No, there, there was one. It, it's the one I did with Chuck Ingalls. The, that we did the but back it was backyard growing of fruit trees and I, oh. I, I can't, and I can't oh remember. the home orchard guide did you help yeah me? the home orchard guide oh, yeah. yeah that's a great one yeah that's a great book and 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 that was you know um, a, a bunch of really really people that I've known for knew for years working together on that to put that together and I had the privilege pr privilege of actually you know being able to contribute to that and I I, I was honored as well but. So when you're, when you're working with uh, backyard orchard culture, what you want to do is you want to start out by making sure your tree is low to begin with. And so if you're doing, so the first picture will be a picture of a tree that was bare root. And that bare root tree, I cut it back at the knee. Okay, always cut your trees back to the knee. And you say, oh my gosh, you know, what? <laughs> what? I paid for this whole tree. I'm going to cut it off at the knee. Well, my comeback to that's really simply simple. You don't grow it. You don't buy a full grown rose. When you go out and buy a rose, you actually grow a rose that has a few buds on it. Um, if they had in early on uh, marketed a full grown rose bush, they probably would have been um, uh, still responsible to that today. Um, these uh, when, when I'm saying to take these trees back to the knee. Um, that's actually the best place to start to get your canopy nice and low because you want to make sure your fruiting body is roughly about six feet tall. So wherever your primary scaffolding limbs begin, um, that's going to be the bottom of your tree. And then wherever you hold it to the ultimate, uh, where it's ultimate height or the top height you're going to keep it at will be, that's, that's going to determine what your entire fruiting body will be. So your, wherever the knee is up to wherever the height you hold it at, you know, if it's, you know, if, if you make a, um, I mean, you're, you're at about 18 inches, I think could be two feet, you know, depending on your knee, I think mine's about, <laughs> about 18 inches. Uh, I'm a short guy. And then, and, um, and then of course, then you add another five foot to that and you end up with, you know, a seven, eight foot tree. Um, and that's what your um, canopy space is for your, your fruit. Um, the second one, I'm showing the knee on a potted tree. Now, when I look for a potted tree, if I'm going and buying a tree that actually is in a container, I really want to look for a tree that actually has a nice set of scaffolding limbs um, already established on the base of the tree. So I want a nice balanced tree um, if, if I'm suggesting that, because I'm going to go back and I'm going to cut the cut the top out of that tree and allow the primary scaffoldings to stay when I plant it. And then the third picture over shows you, you know, what what in essence happens when you have a tree that was cut off at the knee and then your scaffolding limbs all begin right above right above your knee. Okay, so then you're going to get a spring flush 
And in the spring, it'll flush out. You'll take all the new growth that comes off of that tree and you'll cut it back by one third. So you cut that spring flush back by one third. Then in the late summer, you come back for the summer flush and you're gonna cut the summer flush off by one third. And so in the essence, you'll end up with a little bush to start out with. So that, that tree right there is roughly, and that picture is roughly about, um, I'd say probably two and a half feet tall, maybe maybe two feet tall, pretty, pretty short. Now, I gotta point out that with apricots, um, some plum varieties, you may have to put a midsummer cut on them, like an early summer cut. So you'll hit, hit them once after the spring, then you're gonna come in and man, apricots and some plum varieties can grow like a house on fire. And you just realize that they're just growing too fast. And so you really want to come in in the summer, at, in the early summer, and check their growth. So one of the things that you're going to always hear about, you know, the summer pruning is, well, my gosh, if you expose too much of the of the canopy, then you know the, you'll you'll open it up for sunburn. Well, this technique actually eliminates that completely. And if you can see in these two pictures. That first picture being a cutback, you know, from uh, the spring, all right, and the second pic picture being the second cut in the in the summer. What you can see is that there's no exposed limbs on those trees at all. They're all protected by the shade leaves, and so sunburn is never ever an issue if you do backyard orchard culture uh, correct. So you're always cutting back, you know, to make sure that you get. Um, the expression of new growth down below your cut, because that's where your fruiting wood, that, that's where you wanna maintain your fruiting wood is below where those cuts are. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we move forward. So, so the first season, unless apricots, you might have to put on apricots in some varieties, really vigorous varieties. You might have to put an early summer cut on that too. And, I don't know if that's going to be a third cut back or just cut it back to keep it in balance, keep it in check. Okay, second spring, you repeat the cut back of the canopy by one third in the spring. Okay, same difference. And then, of course, another third in the late summer. So this is after the late summer pruning. And so now I've got a tree that's probably every bit of three feet tall. So let me point out that that in the projects that I did in the early 90s, um, I used all standard rootstocks. I used nothing but standards. No, in my, in my big, I, and I had big test plots where I was working, um, but this one tree is the one tree that I really, I picked on more than any, and it's a Santa Rosa plum. And, uh, and, the, and the object of this tree was to hold it at 40 inches tall. So I wasn't quite, successful in that, in that I got lazy as time moved on and missed some opportunities some years, and I'll take complete responsibility for that. But as a matter of fact, that was my goal was to maintain a tree that was lower than five feet tall. And the Santa Rosa plum being so fruitful, fr fruitful um, lent itself to being the perfect choice. But I also did this with a uh, cherry as well. I kept a cherry at 40 inches as well for the same amount of time. So in late summer, you get you get your cut back by a third, and then and then in the late summer, another third, and then you end up with this bush. Now at this time, you start to get what they call uh, what I call crow's feed, and it's where every you make the cut, you'll get like three or four different limbs, branches all all um, uh, coming out of that uh, or below that one cut. And really what you have to do with that second late summer cut now, you have to start going in and really thinning those out. Um, and that's, it's not too difficult to understand once you've seen it done. And I would encourage you to go look at some of my videos, um, especially the ones that are on uh, Edible Solutions, because um, I really tried to show exactly what that is. Cutting out crow's feet, like eliminating, like if there's four limbs that pop up from a cut, eliminating three of them and just keeping one. And that just keeps the, uh, the tree from getting crowded up on top. 
But the idea is you're always promoting the fruiting wood lower. You're keeping the fruiting wood lower in the canopy. That's, that's the idea. So on the third spring, you choose a height that you will maintain your tree at, because in this case, by the third by the third year, you should have had you should have a tree that actually is, you know, I don't know. My in this case, my tree was always going to be at 40 inches tall. So that was my goal. So I cut back the tree and kept it at 40 inches tall. So this was the third spring at 40 inches. And 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 now I'm just going in and doing maintenance like eliminating crow's feet. I'm going in and opening it up, opening it up for um, sunlight and air circulation. So I'm just going in and doing some random pruning to allow air circulation in. And the beauty of this <clears throat> is that in, in many cases, I'm doing this at the same time that I'm thinning. So I'm actually knocking fruit out of the tree, which is really good because I mean, this Santa Rosa plum set so much fruit every year. I think the the smallest year I ever had was 150 pieces of fruit. Um, and I believe that was 96 when we got all that flooding and rain and stuff, and it still produced too many fruit. But <clears throat> the year after year, but the idea is, is that I do the spring pruning right around the time that I'm thinning, and it kind of combines the two jobs. And plus, I see where the fruit's setting, and so I can make my cuts relative to allowing air and sunlight into the canopy by uh, by you know seeing where the fruit's located and don't let me make this sound any more complicated because it isn't really what it is is it 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 is a it's a learning curve you go in you can't make a mistake there's no such thing as making a mistake there, it could be argued that you've made a mistake doing what I'm suggesting but the fact of the matter is is that as you get in and you just work with your tree and prune your tree and work with your tree, you get more and more comfortable and you find that the results of, of controlling the size of your tree and making sure your air circulation, your sunlight penetration is good. Um, you just find that, that you put less and less work in because you start making cuts that are relative to um, and eliminating um, uh, big, big bushy areas of the tree because you can see that they need to be eliminated. It's much different than winter pruning because you get to really make the connection of that's a problem that needs to be addressed. I can prune it right now and take care of it. And that's the beauty of summer pruning is that you get to see the tree while it's actively growing. You get to see what it's not doing and then prune it out. When the winter time, you got to wear sunglasses to get into your tree because, you know, you're only going to prune on a sunny day and all you're going to see is a tree without leaves or fruit or nothing. And you can make some assumptions, but I sure find summer pruning is definitely better for the novice gardener, um, even, even myself now, because I can make cuts that I can see are rele relevant to something. So then maintain that height year. after year. So this pro this project went on for, I believe 12 years. So I got, I've got pictures up to eight years. And as you can see on year six, I, it got a little bit out of hand. <laughs> I think I brought it back under control in year seven, but um, the idea was, you know, and, and I think in year eight, you can see, you know, there's fruit hanging everywhere. There was always fruit hanging everywhere on it. We, uh, I, my son worked with me closely back in these days. And I would, I, I a couple of years, I said, uh, just take this bamboo pole and go out and just, just knock it through the tree and thin, thin out the tree. Cause it's got too much fruit in it. I call that stick thinning and, uh, it, it was effective. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the idea is that I, I really wanted to make sure that I was doing something like this with uh, a tree that was familiar, number one, on a standard rootstock, number two. And then was it going to stay productive? You know, was that tree going to maintain, you know, uh, enough fruit for, for me to be satisfied that I would enjoy that? And, and I'll give you an example. A full-size Santa Rosa plum tree is, is capable of producing roughly about 1,500 pieces of fruit, all right? And uh, the average 
Uh, and for all of you who have Santa Rosa plums, you probably already know that. They all come ripe at one time. Um, if you really want a clever way to deal with that, you put a sheet down below your Santa Rosa plum so it catches them because they really are prime ripe when they're hitting the ground and really tasting their best. And so if you put a sheet down below uh, and it doesn't impact the uh, fruit, doesn't impact the ground, bacteria doesn't set in right away and your fruit will last longer. So you can, and you can pick them up off your sheet. So that's a great way to deal with the Santa Rosa plum I find, find and a couple of others that have that characteristic. But um and, and we, have a, oh, we have oh, a couple oh. questions about yeah. some ahead. of the things you've talked about. So I wasn't sure what part you were going to move on to, but. Um, oh, yeah, we, this is a great time to do it because I am going to move on to applica some applications. That's what I was kind of thinking. And I have to say, Ed, I have a peach tree, uh, well, actually two peach trees that are. Uh, oh, Henry, my absolute favorite. And I think I've told you this before, but when it came time to cut them at knee level, I couldn't do it, Ed. And this was uh, quite, quite a few years ago. I cut it at three feet and I have been sorry ever since because they get to about eight feet tall, um, maybe even a little taller. And it's just, as you know, with peaches, it's just so much wood and it's just Yes. Um, I planted a new one the following year, cut it at the knee, super happy with it. It is actually still below, I would say three and a half feet. Uh, yeah. So it's great. Um, yeah, makes a big difference. Yeah. And so one person asked about, um, they said, so I need to buy a bare root tree that has branches below knee level. So I think they may not have understood that they might have been confused when you talked about the bare root fruit tree versus the container tree. Correct, right. If you're shopping for a container tree, then choose a tree because with the container tree, you're quite often looking at trees that could very well be a year old in the container as well. And I find that they don't respond as well, but a, but a nice fresh bit, uh, tree in a container, you know, first year tree in a container works just fine. But let me make another point too. I like smaller caliper. You know, a lot of people will go for that big, you know, three quarter inch, one inch tree, but I don't find that they respond as well um, when they're young. I like, you know, five eighths inch trees or smaller. I favor those uh, to be exact. I prefer those. And, uh, and I think that they respond beautifully. I mean, they just, they, you know, you prune them, they say, sure, that's what you want me to do. Boom. They they're doing it. But the bare root tree, I mean, it, it's a whip and, or, or it, even if it has branches on them, I would rather have you cut it at the knee, cut all the branches off. Perfect. Okay. And um, let's see, there's quite a few different questions here. Um, should spring pruning be after last frost? Um, I, I, you know, spring pruning to me, is after um let i guess the answer to that is yes depending on where you live like if you're in lake tahoe probably you know if you're up in uh, placerville maybe you know up in the foothills um then your late frosts are a little bit um more in line with uh, a, a spring flush you know what i'm gonna take that back i'm gonna say i don't care no i i think i think you're free to prune it at any time you want when when the spring flush is done, you know, it's kind of like maybe Mayish, May you know, sometime May, you know, and so I usually am I'm hitting it the first time in May, you know, um, that's when I put my first cut on is May. And so I, I would say no, because really, I mean, the only thing you'd be concerned with would be the um, would be the the uh, exposure of the new buds. And I, I think to to freeze I don't know. You know, that, 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 that's a question I'm going to kind of, I'm going to punt on. I'm going to say that um, use your better judgment. If it's, if you're in an area where you get hard, late freezes, it's probably not as good an idea. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I don't think I can give you a straight forward answer other than in most, in most cases in California situations, short of, you know, like I said, Tahoe, something like that, I probably wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then another good question. Can you do this with pomegranates? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pomegranates, you know, pomegranates, people let pomegranates get too big. They take over their yard, you know, I mean. You know, you know my neighbors, yeah, my neighbor's pomegranate is so tall. The only 
the only creatures eating it right now are rats. And I can tell because uh, they're dropping the um, outside shells on my side of the fence. Right. And, you know, and that's a big problem because, you know, a lot of things you get to control a lot of things when you have your fruit trees under size control. And one of them is rodent prop, prop problems are a lot easier to take care of too. And so, yeah, no, pomegranates are a cinch to maintain low. I mean, we maintain pomegranates low here in the nursery row just simply because we take budwood off of them or, or our cutting wood off of them. And so they get pruned for, for, the, for the sake of, uh, of cutting and they still produce a tremendous amount of fruit. So, I, mm -hmm. yeah, size control on pomegranate, absolutely. Awesome. And, yeah, and, there, and, you know, pomegranates can be a spalliard too. Oh, beautiful. And, yeah. you know, somebody was asking about recommended spacing, but I think you're going to be talking about that later, or did I miss it? Yeah, no, I, I'll talk a little bit about, about spacing. So um, coming up, that's what we're going to Okay, perfect. Into. That's what I thought. And uh, somebody has a Blenheim apricot from seed on its own root stock. Mm -hmm. um, I'm about to plant it in the ground. Would that have any impact on this process? No, not at all. But um, you know, I'd warn you that Blenheim apricot on its own root is going to be real, real sensitive to heavy, heavy soil. So you better have perfect drainage. Um, and uh, that, you know, that that's pretty much it. Uh, but no, um, you you uh, you can grow anything on its own root and prune it to whatever. Um, the, the big the big question becomes whether or not its own root is going to be adapted to the soil conditions or the disease problems that you may have in your area. So that that would be the only caution I would give you. Mm hmm. And then we have had a lot of questions about overgrown fruit trees. And I did share the uh, guide to pruning overgrown fruit trees in a couple places. Uh, but Ed, could you say, would you say that if an older tree about 15 years old was pruned, would it increase production or is it too late? No, you know, and, and actually one of the first things I did when I moved into Modesto back in the early 1990s, I moved into Modesto about 91. My neighbor had an apricot tree that actually came across our yard and his apricot tree was roughly about 25 feet tall. And so um, he immediately came over to my house and said, listen, I apologize for that tree. I've been meaning to take it out for years. He goes, um, you know, I'll take, I'm going to take it out, you know, this, this year right away. And I said, the heck you are. <laughs> I said, that's an apricot tree coming <laughs> into my yard. I said, we'll work with that tree and we'll bring it down. We had um, we had eight foot fences in Modesto in our particular neighborhood. Uh, I brought that tree down so it just cascaded right over the top of, of my eight foot fence and, and really fit into his yard really, really nice and comfortable. And we enjoyed that apricot together for years. So, and that tree was roughly about probably 25 years old. Um, you, the the methodology is actually a lecture in itself for mm -hmm. for what they call drop scaffolding. So mm -hmm. and and it takes about three years to accomplish. And you have to use for the for the best advice. I would say you have to use the um, uh, what do you call it uh, the system of thirds. You know you only want to bring it down a third every time, but you want to mix. Um, in my way of doing it, you mix winter pruning with summer pruning. Um, and uh, like I said, it, it's almost a, a lecture in itself. It really, it really is, um, because I think almost every yard has an overgrown fruit tree. I know I moved into a house with two overgrown um, nectarine trees, and it was just a mess to deal with because at some point, um, you know, there's a lot of times when you inherit a fruit tree that has just not been taken care of, it's sunburned, it's got all sorts of, of issues, so... Yeah. And then um, I think people are just wanting to know uh, what trees they can do this on. So it's essentially stone fruits, palm fruits, any deciduous fruit tree. Is that correct? Correct. Ed? Any deciduous fruit tree, any citrus, um, avocados. Avocados can get, you know, 50 feet tall. Um, don't let an avocado get 50 feet tall like my, the one at my son's house. <laughs> He's got wow. So this fruit bush method can be used on citrus. You would just have to be careful not to, I mean, cause they are evergreen. How would that work? Well, citrus actually is one of the easiest plants to maintain size on there is in my estimation. I mean, I, I, I had a citrus hedge at one time in Napa that I pruned with hedge clippers to keep it under control and it produced tons of fruit. So 
I, I mean, the idea of managing size on a fruit tree actually, you know, really encompasses two things. And that is, you know, choosing a size, not let, letting it get any taller than that size. And then number two, learning to work with the tree so that it, it, it so you can allow air, circul air circulation and air penetration by, by when you're pruning it and for size control, you're eliminating some of the um, bunching of limbs that occurs um, in the canopy. And those two things come along with size control. You just learn, you just see, you know, that, oh, mm -hmm. this is too much. I got to cut this out. I got to cut that out. And, mm -hmm. and you, you, I, I usually tell people by the third year of practicing backyard orchard culture, you're actually, re, you're actually ready for a standard pruning lecture. And the reason being is because now you've under, you understand how this tree grows because you're actually working with it with, while it's actively growing. You understand mm -hmm. all of the methodologies that are imparted on you in a, back, in, in a uh, conventional pruning lecture. And you can go sit in there and go, oh, yeah, I get it. I get it. Whereas most mm -hmm. people go out and, you know, when they buy a stick, put it in the ground, go listen to a pruning lecture. And then two years later, they can't find the paper. They can't remember what <laughs> And they and they're afraid to prune the tree because the person that was giving the lecture was so serious about everything had to be done just like this. And I'm right. trying to say that, that it, it isn't so the serious part is maintain your size of your trees. Mm -hmm. And Ed, can you address growing deciduous fruit trees in pots? People are asking yeah, about there, there are there are really no deciduous trees that I found that do well in pots. Um, I figs are OK. Pomegranates are okay. Citrus does incredibly well in containers. Um, but man, I tell you, if I could come up, with, uh, avocados don't do well. Um, if I could come up with a, a, a way of growing uh, fruit trees in containers, because I know that expanded our market, man, I, I, I tested uh, soils, containers, everything I could. But the deciduous rootstocks just grow so dang fast mm -hmm. and they get, they, they get root bound so quickly in the can and root pruning sets the tree back. And so, you know, mm -hmm. people who talk about root pruning, I mean, you, you've got to be, you got to be a bonsai expert to be able to take and, mm -hmm. you know, pull and so what out. about citrus trees in containers, Ed? What's Perfect. Your... They're great. They love it. They're like raising fish in a fishbowl. They just go, <laughs> I guess I've got to grow in a container. So I'll, I'll awesome. just sit root and be great. You know, so awesome. I love citrus and containers are great. Great. Well, we'll we'll let you get back to the uh, slideshow. There's a few more questions, but we'll save them for the end. Okay. So let's uh, let's get on to the next. So I'm going to go through some methodologies that are. Uh, so once you've taken on the the um, what do you call it um, the 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 responsibility of of size control. Now it opens you up to a world of different things that you can do, and uh, this is the high density planting, and high density planting. Um, really comes in what I call these four categories, multiple planted fruit trees, hedgerows, espaliers, and, and then multi-budded fruit trees as well. So the first is multiple planted fruit trees. And um, let's see, I think the three trees in one hole on the right, that's uh, three peaches on the right, that's uh, from the Fair Oaks Hort Center. They've got a wonderful uh, program up there. I, actually, I'm going to be working with them to re, we're going to re- um, reinvigorate because that program is 20 some odd years old. A lot of the trees are old, you know, they've passed their half-life and they need to be replaced. So we're going to go in there and we're going to redo the whole project, which is really great. I'm excited. And I, I'm really sad that my dear friend, Chuck Ingalls, you know, won't be a part of it. Um, but, and then the three plums in one hole that you see on the other side, that's actually at my house. Um, I have a number of different high density plantings there. And these um, these trees, this, this is a, an earlier picture. These trees are about 13, 14 years old now. Um, and the ones at Fair Oaks and that, those trees there are probably, they're easily 20. So, and so some of the rules about multiple plantings, and, and I like three trees in one hole, despite the fact that I've got that picture of the four cherries in one hole, which was featured in Sunset Magazine and all kinds of other things. And, and, uh, my, my I, I, I find four in one holes a little bit more daunting just to maintain. You always end up with a, the back two trees um, struggling. So the trees that are always to the north um, all of, of your planting always tend to be a little bit more difficult to keep vigorous because they lose sunlight as the trees get older. But I find that three trees in one hole, never a problem at all. It just seems that it's much easier to keep the sunlight penetration 
into the canopy much easier. And you just raise those three trees like an open center, like they were one on one trunk and you open up the center of the of the um, of the planting to make it an open center um, uh, fruit tree on three trunks. And so I, I can walk inside of the, the trees on the left. I can walk inside the center of them and pick and prune from the center. Those trees are, uh, you can see my the six foot fence. So those trees are just a little taller than the six foot fence that um, is next to them. So uh, two to three feet on center um, in a triangle form. Um, or if, you know, if you're going to grow them in the, um, in a, uh, square, then, uh, I would say three foot on center. And then one of the rules like spray, spray requirements. So you don't want to have, you know, apples in with peaches that you have to spray for peach leaf curl, um, or that, um, apples that you might have to treat for coddling moth or depending on what your methodologies that you use in terms of growing your fruit trees, you always want to make sure you're not growing varieties together where you're going to be harvesting fruit at the same time, a fruit tree may very well need some kind of, um, some kind of an application of chemical. Um, and then um, never let any one variety dominate. And that's a big problem with uh, high density plantings. And that is that, you know, there's always that one variety of tree that wants to go faster than all the rest of them. And, and the rule of thumb, never let any one variety dominate on the right hand side. It says cut back at any time to maintain balance. So you always want to feel like if one tree is growing faster than the other and going to shade out anything else, cut it back. Just make sure you're maintaining an equal distribution of sunlight and air. You can, you know, any more, you know, I, I prune too many times during the year, um, but I, I go out with my shears on, you know, my, my primary, my primary dwarfing tool here. And I go out with my shears on regularly and, um, and just kind of look and, and say, oh man, I'll take this limb off, take that limb off. So, so I'm really taking off stuff randomly during this, randomly during the season anyways. So that, that's pretty much multiple plantings, high density plantings. Hedgerow, and the hedgerow, man, I sure see hedgerow a lot with citrus. I don't see it as much with deciduous trees, but if you look on the left side again, um, that's a hedgerow that I had. I, I had a hedgerow with 70 varieties of assorted fruit trees, peaches, nectarines, plums, apricots um, in, in, in the uh, hedgerow at uh, Dave Wilson Nursery. So that was, um, I think the hedgerow there was probably around five years old, six years old there, and we had been maintaining it. Um, that hedgerow ran east to west, um, so you literally could go to the north side during the hot, hot summer, and you could crawl underneath the canopies, and you could pick fruit, you could prune the trees, um, everything was, it, it was just so nice to get under the hedgerow, and the, um, these are three foot on center, so I, I had hedgerows that even were closer, 18 inches on center, two foot on center, and three foot on center were what I had experimented with. Um, I actually like the three foot on center or four foot on center, even for hedgerow um, now, um, just because I think there's a lot more ability to be able to take and keep the trees from growing into one another. Um, so a three foot tree means you have uh, one and a half foot of canopy on each side, and you have to maintain that right from the beginning, you know, to be able to ensure that you get that in a hedgerow. But citrus hedgerows, this is at uh, the other one on the, on the right, that is, or uh, on the left, that actually is at Fair Oaks, and they maintain a really nice citrus hedge there. And that's, uh, I think that's six foot, five or six foot on center. And uh, it's beautiful and uh, produces tons of fruit. <laughs> and it's, it's really cool. And uh, then in Napa, I think this is down by the French Laundry. Uh, there's a uh, six foot on center a fig hedge that's been there a long time and they just maintain that I think the same way just by just by cutting it with a head shears and it's always got a lot of fruit on it as well. So hedgerow, hedgerow is another form of high density planting and you can see when you ask about what the centers are the centers differ you got to remember the closer you plant them together the more you better plan on you know doing some extra work. So when you get into high density planting you know, you're really talking about really having to be on top of uh, sunlight penetration and air penetration and not letting the trees get too dense. So it does require a little bit more. That's not the case with citrus though. 
Citrus just is so easy to work with on so many levels, you know, from container growing to, you know, having it do whatever you want it to do. I mean, three trees in one hole with citrus is a breeze. So, and keep in mind that, that these are varieties that actually are pretty versatile and I'll show you why as well. And my favorite, you know, uh, topic for the last probably 10 years has been espalier and Chuck Ingalls and I were working on some great espalier projects when he passed off. Uh, unfortunately, one of them is at is on the left there at the top. That's the peach uh, tree that he uh, espaliered at the Ferox Hort Center. And he was doing incredible, uh, making incredible strides and learning how to uh, maintain a peach in an espalier. Um, it's not an easy thing to do because you constantly have to be re renewing wood um, because, you know, of course, uh, peach is set on last year's wood. And so you have to constantly be renewing wood. But but we found it was pretty easy once you got into the stride of understanding, you know, what new wood was and how to cut it back. Um, so Chuck was doing a great, great job on that. It was it was really cool. Um, on the right hand side, that four in one pair, that's my my uh, four in one grafted pear um, espaliered on my back fence. Um, it's, um, I think, I think it's 12 years old now. Um, it, uh, it's, it's great. I, I have all kinds of different, my favorite variety of pear is called the Warren pear. It's a fire blight resistant pear to be exact. Every one of the varieties I've grafted onto this uh, four in one are fire blight resistant. And so, uh, but Warren is my favorite for flavor. Absolutely, it's delicious. And and uh, Ed, I planted one last year. Oh, good. <laughs> so good. I'm I'm waiting. I know there's oh, another yeah. pair you recommended. Um, well, let's see. If if, if there were going to be two, um, it would be either Potomac or or Blake's Pride. Blake's Pride. Yeah, somebody yeah. beat me to the nursery before I could get that one. So oh yeah, yeah. Blake's Pride is delicious too. It's fire blight resistant, but it really, you know, it's really comies like and it so it's it's mm -hmm. just a real great piece of fruit. And and keep in mind, you know, one of the things that I've really been doing with the spoliers for years that Chuck and I were working on, we were looking at working on covering technique. Believe it or not, it wasn't the espalier, it was the technique we were using because we were figuring that. With the with less and less chemicals available in the years to come, that we would be wanting to take and have other methodologies to be able to take and protect trees against you know pests and learning their life cycle and telling people when to put up covers and things like that um, and, and using different fabrics were what Chuck and I were working on together. And unfortunately, with Chuck's passing, all that research stopped, and I haven't had you know, a colleague that uh, I had the opportunity to work with to, to um, initiate that re research any further. And there are some new fabrics coming out that are absolutely wonderful. So um, we, we could make inroads there. Maybe somebody else is already doing it, I hope, and, uh, and, uh, and complementing what we need for the future. Uh, the, you can see the lemon espalier. I mean, citrus is so easy to espalier and makes such a beautiful espalier. The one thing wrong with that lemon espalier picture is that I don't recommend that you put any espalier right up against a wall like that because, I mean, and I know, I think that's a concrete wall. I know ultimately that concrete wall probably will never have to have maintenance done to it, but putting up um, an espalier onto an existing wood fence or something like that's just not a good idea because think think about the uh, maintenance you'll have to do with the wood fence to the wood fence someday and you probably have to take and take down your espalier to be able to do that uh, or maybe damage your espalier to tremendously to be able to accomplish that. So I always recommend two feet out from any any um, uh, what do you call it. Um, uh, maintained uh, um, uh, fence or something like that, and then um, on its own structure, free structure. And the uh, the next one is a candelabra. It, it's the extreme of espalier. You know, I, I tend to recommend for espalier, I recommend what they call a fan shape. It's so easy to do. And fan is, you know, it just doesn't require, you know, this extraordinary artistic kind of uh, approach to espalier. And um, but up at uh, up at Rain Tree and at, and uh, this apple is a spalliard in the front of the nursery there, and I always I couldn't help but say you know oh my gosh I got to take a picture of that because you know it's uh, this candelabra approach it's it's relatively easy to do and um, you know and it's pretty easy to maintain especially in an apple or a pear so. So it, I think that yeah, it's fun. 
and and keep in mind, you know, like I said, figs are so easy to put uh, espalier. Pomegranates are so easy to espalier. The, the things that you can espalier are so surprising. And yes, you have to thin. <laughs> yes, you have to prune. <laughs> All those things you have to do. But I mean, the the lack of space that they take up, and you know, the amount of fruit being you know just right. I mean, you know, how many lemons can you use off your lemon tree? You know, it's, I, I, I have two lemon trees in my yard and I, I think I can't part with either of them, but I could <laughs> one because <laughs> I have too many lemons all the time. But um, anyway. Never too many lemons, Ed. You can do so yeah. many with lemons. Yeah, I know. I know. Except at my house. You would definitely agree if you had all the lemons we have. <laughs> I, could, I think there's such thing as too many grapefruits, but not too many lemons. I, I like guess, you can I, live, you can give lemons away. I had a hard time giving grapefruits away. Well, you know, it's it, and it's funny you say that. I have the Oro Blanco grapefruit and I love it. And it's been in a container for 40, I think for 40, about 45 oh, years. Amazing. Right. And I actually have a video on actually, I, I had to transplant it out and renew all. The, I got to do another video because, because all of the work that I did to it in this one video, actually it's all paid off. It's beautiful. Again, it's got a huge crop on it again. And, and uh, it's an or Blanco. I love or Blanco. And I agree with you. You know, it's very few who, who I share my Oro Blancos with that go, oh my gosh, this is the best <laughs> thing I've ever had. Right. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. I still love it. But, and lastly, uh, multiple budded fruit trees and multiple budded fruit trees are perfectly viable. There's a couple of very, very important rules that people just don't get with multiple budded fruit trees. And the, um, you know, the um, con constant complaint is, oh my gosh, you know, um, I always lose one variety. Well, the only way you lose one variety on a, four, on a multiple budded fruit tree is if you all allow all the other um, variety or other varieties that are more um, vigorous uh, to dominate the, the planting. So number one is always plant the weakest when you're planting the tree and you're planting a multiple bud that you bought, always plant the weakest grower to the south or southwest so that it gets maximum sunlight because it's also going to probably be the smallest lateral limb too of or smallest bud. And so it's going to need all the horsepower that it can get starting off to compete against its more vigorous um, companions on the on the planting. Um, but probably more important than that is never let any one variety dominate. The same rule for multiple plantings is the same rule for multiple budded because it's the same thing. You're creating an open center. And so all these three or four varieties that are grafted onto this tree uh, really have to exist in balance and in harmony. So you have to check any time the vigor of one variety over another. And I can tell you, the apricot, when you get, you know, that, that one picture there, the peach, plum, apricot, fruit salad. Oh, man, the apricot is a nightmare for the first couple of years because the apricot wants to grow like crazy. And believe it or not, whenever I get into a situation where somebody says, oh, my gosh, the fruit salad tree just doesn't work because, you know, one variety always takes over. Well, nine, nine times out of 10, it's an apricot that took over and checking that apricot just be brutal. Make mm -hmm. sure it just stays stays in check. And also I get that complaint with Santa Rosa plums too. So, but just be brutal, keep them in check, keep them balanced. This, you know, anybody can guess how tall that tree is in that picture. That tree looks enormous, but that tree is as tall as I am with my hands extended above my head. That's how tall that tree is. And the one, uh, that four in one pluot is in my yard. And that's, that tree is as tall as I am with my hands extended above my head. I, I prune it without a ladder and I get, a, I, I had a tremendous crop this year as well. Mm -hmm. So, oh, oh, one more way. So last, let me, let me do this here. So last, I got a little short video. I want everybody to take a look at. It's just a real short video. Let's see if it's going to play. Hmm. Sorry, we ran into a problem while playing media this presentation. Try again later. <laughs> oh, well. Anyways, it, it, it's a video that's up on one of my um, 
on on one of the web page. It's on the edible solution page. And basically all it talks about is just size control is water conservation. It means water conservation as well. Because keep in mind, a full size tree uses more water than a tree that's actually managed to a reasonable size. So the really when you're thinking about our challenges you know in our um uh, in water availability going forward size control is a is a huge contribution to um maintaining um how much moisture you need to actually get a great crop off your tree as well and don't forget mulch everything i mean everything should be mulched with three four inches of mulch you know just to take and cut down the evaporation around the root and to maintain the coolness and the and the moisture level in the primary root zone in the top of the tree. Oh, you still there? Yep, we're all here. Oh, okay, good. I thought maybe my my video attempt actually. Nope, we're no. still good. Dang it, the video was pretty cool too. Yeah. <laughs> Best laid plans, Ed. All right. Any other questions? Uh, there are tons of questions. Well, I'm ready. Uh, but uh, okay, but there's they're um, still about all sorts of other stuff. So, uh, was this your last? This is your last slide here. Yep. Yep. That's okay. It. So we have a lot of questions. Let's see here but they're for kind of, they're a little bit all over the place. Some are about mature trees, some are about uh, citrus trees, but I thought this one was pretty good. Uh, this person says, my my, pe my peach and Santa Rosa plum grow five feet every season. How does keeping them short with the one third cut work then? So I'm assuming this person has a tree that's probably a little bit out of control already. You're right. And it's becoming a monster as he watches with horror, I would imagine. So how does that one third work cut? So one third, one third really is applicable while when you're growing the tree up. Okay. So what we what we just discussed and what we what we covered was how you deal with getting the tree up to you where you can control it, despite the fact that it wants to put on five feet of growth a year. Okay. So this this really was covering how you get to that point. Now, if you've got a tree that's already growing, you know, and it and it's established and really hasn't had any of this done to it, then it does seem like a daunting task. But the idea is that you've got to bring that back, that tree back by a third. Uh, let me see if I can just summarize it. So really what it requires is this. In the wintertime, you cut it back by I, I, I'll tell you what, depending on the age of the tree, I, it, you, you, you can cut it back by a third to a half during the winter time. Then you may lose a lot of fruiting because, you know, like, like when you're trying to bring down a tree from size control with size control, a lot of times you're cutting into, you know, all the, all the, all the fruiting wood is way up high. And so you just almost have to sacrifice it for a year. So you cut it back by a third to a half. And then during the summer, about say the end of the spring, you come back and you cut it right to that same point again. That really takes and pushes all of the energy, the growth of um, pushing new buds down below where that first cut was made during the wintertime. So that pushes it down into the canopy. That's where you want it. You want to reinitiate what they call latent buds uh, in the tree and, and get it to reestablish, you know, limbs lower down in the canopy if, if it possibly can. And then you want to do the same thing the following year. A winter cut, bring it down even more, harder, because that summer cut will help to get those buds, latent buds, active so that when you put that winter cut on it, that, that winter cut by a third to a half, you want to take and when that's done, you want it to push again from down lower. And then in the summertime, again, bring it back cut all that off at that winter flush right there. And that now you should have a bush that's that, that's actually um, developing by that third season. In the third season, you just decide how tall you want it to be and you start maintaining it at that height. So it takes three seasons, it takes two seasons. And then the third season, you're actively you know, seeking out 
the height you want it to be and where you're going to maintain it. But you can kind of see where uh, it's kind of complicated in terms of, um, you know, just doing it in a summary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. And Ed, people are asking about links to your videos. And I know you have videos in a couple different places. Yeah, I have videos uh, on Facebook at Ed Able Solutions. So it's okay. I can put that link in the chat. Yeah, E D A B L E Solutions, and then I have um, videos at tomorrowsharvest.com. Well, it, it would be, um, yeah, it it, it would be. Um, uh, uh, pardon me. Let's do it this way. I have videos at at the Facebook and on um, on um, uh, Instagram at Tomorrow's Harvest Nursery. I will go ahead and put at Tomorrow's Harvest Nursery. Then we have videos on on um, Tomorrow's Harvest on Nursery on YouTube. Okay, you have a, a YouTube channel for Tomorrow's Harvest? Yeah, but it's it doesn't have all that the Facebook and the uh, Instagram have on it, I'm afraid. Mm, okay, so people are just going to kind of have to go on to Facebook and Instagram to search for some of these? Yeah, hunt around. And then and then the, the last one that, uh, that I, got, I got a lot on Dave Wilson that I've done on uh, uh, Dave Wilson. Okay. You know, I did, uh, you know, a hundred at Dave Wilson. And then um, I have a lot on uh, another um, nursery called uh, Nature Hills Nursery. And those are on YouTube, Nature Hills Nursery on YouTube. Uh, there's a bunch of videos that I've, I've done on there too. I've done videos for lots and lots and lots of people through the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see your uh, videos here for Dave Wilson Nursery. So I'm putting those in the chat. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I can, uh, I will email everybody later also with a lot of these links. So, and then, uh, before I post this online, I will go ahead and, um, put that on there. So, um, a couple of the other questions were about, um, some people were concerned about, um, diseases, especially with, uh, cherry and apricot. And I feel like there's some kind of conflicting advice sometimes on what to do. Sure. It, depending on where you live. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, like, for instance, um, apricots and cherries aren't, aren't much pruned in the wintertime at all anymore by commercial growers, um, simply because of disease. So they're more pr pruned in the fall. Um, a, or in the late summer. Um, and so one of the things that I point out is that the commercial growers aren't trying to achieve the, the dramatic size control that we are in the home garden. And so the, the difference in being more aggressive and actually spacing that pruning out is because I don't want to ever have those trees get that big. You know, those trees need to stay under control all the time. And it's almost like, you know, I, I call it like ra raising fish in a fishbowl a lot of times. After a couple of years, a tree, I think, kind of gets the idea. All right, you don't want me to grow very tall. I get it. And it starts to slow down. I think that that's partially age and the juvenility starts to starts to lessen as mm -hmm. a factor. But but I but it's it, it's kind of like being aggressive with two prunings, possibly three on apricots and some varieties of plums a year, actually make sure that you keep that tree in check and you're pruning it while it's actively growing. And so, you know, the, the opportunity for disease is less because the trees, you know, circulatory system is actually is active and its ability to heal and callus, you know, very quickly is there. And so, you know, there's just a lot of factors that are working in your favor. So, but air circulation and sunlight are very important in terms of being able to make sure that you don't create a canopy that's too dense from pruning it back so hard. So that's why I encourage everybody to, you know, go in, look at where you're getting clustering at the top of your canopy and go in and thin out your clustering and leave one lateral limb and, you mm -hmm. know, and, and really control the, um, the, the density of the top to allow sunlight and air circulation because those become important to cutting down on mildew, mildews and funguses and, and even bacteria. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, and this was a good question. Any recommendations for varieties that do well in clay soil? Well, that's a rootstock issue more than anything else, depending on where you're growing. Clay soils are, are tremendously rich in nutrients. They just lack um, good air circulation. So in clay soils, I, I always recommend, don't even question whether or not the rootstock's gonna be tolerant enough. Um, apples and pears tend to have pretty tolerant rootstocks, they have the clay soils, but man, most of the stone fruit, it's questionable. So I always recommend elevated plantings. So get your trees, you know, elevated at least 12 inches above the soil line. I don't even recommend planting in the ground. Um, I recommend like building a three foot square box and plant your trees and fill it full of native soil. I'm not big into soil amendments either because the soil that it, you want it to get used to the soil that it has to live in. And by putting it into highly amended soils, a lot of times you actually uh, lessen the tree's desire to go out and get uh, established in the native soil. We want it to get it established in the native soil right away. And so elevated planting so that there's a buffer zone of oxygen available so that the root system establishes above that heavy clay soil, a portion of it does. And then that way, no matter how wet the soil gets, it's kind of got a snorkel effect. There's oxygen coming into this root system that's above, above ground and it's providing oxygen to keep the roots that are healthy, or keep the roots healthy that are inundated with moisture. And that's primarily a winter issue. When we get great winter rains, a lot of times these trees that are planted in wrong places and have gone through long periods of, of dry, they, they're the first to die and they die simply because the, uh, the people that planted them didn't realize that there was a drainage issue there. Mm -hmm. Great. So elevated, elevated planting is the best way to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then a couple of uh, folks had questions on citrus. Um, they're asking, can you get a mandarin citrus now and cut it to knee length? Yeah, you know, citrus is kind of a different, it's a different plant. You know, you don't necessarily have to cut a, a citrus to uh, to knee height. It, it, you know, the tree, citrus wants to bush anyways. And citrus really wants to have a low canopy anyways. There's a lot of things about citrus that really are more complementary to backyard orchard culture than, than they are to conventional pruning. In many mm -hmm. cases, I think conventional pruning actually goes contrary to what a citrus would rather do. So I'm not, I don't know if uh, we really need to cut off a citrus at the knee either. I, I, anyways, just planting it and then just make, making sure that you encourage it to, to bush out, which it'll do on its own anyways. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, don't limit up so high that it has a tremendous trunk on it, put you on a ladder the first time it's got fruit. Uh, plant it in a location that accommodates your a nice wide canopy because you know when you're when you're growing a shorter citrus. I mean, I wish I would. Yeah, I wish I I have citrus at my house and I have beautiful citrus at my house and it's all very low canopied and uh, you can't you can't see the ground around it, but it's pruned mm -hmm. up just enough to keep it off the ground. So no, I don't think citrus really needs the the cut off at the knee. I think that's mostly for your deciduous um, mm -hmm. trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, oh, the other thing we want to make sure people know is that citrus is not pruned in the winter the way deciduous fruit trees are. It's better to prune them in the spring. Yeah, you know, we did a lot of research when I was at Four Winds because I, I actually was at Four Winds for some time as well. And we found that, you know, if the tree was well fed going and, and, and well irrigated, not overwatered, overwatering with citrus is the biggest problem that everybody has. Mm -hmm. But as long as the tree was well fed, the idea of pruning it, you know, really, it, it didn't seem to make it more susceptible to freeze. When we have a mm -hmm. freeze um, that's cold enough to do damage to a citrus here, I don't mm -hmm. care. You know, it, it it's really not, you know, you're not going to lessen it just because you promoted yeah. real of growth because you promoted it late in the season. We found that, that, it being well fed going into dormancy was probably the greatest contribution and that the root system wasn't compromised by being overwatered because if it, especially if it's in a can, the bottom of that, sit, the, the uh, root system in the bottom of that pod is very susceptible to a disease called Phytophthora and they, they die back and they won't even show that the root system's dying back, but that root won't even be able to reach the bottom of the can because the Phytophthora is actually keeping mm -hmm. it in check. And so, you know, and then it, of course what happens is, is it, let's say it goes through the winter time like that and in the spring, you know, the tree leaves out and I mean, not leaves out, but the tree starts 
starts to grow and it's yellow and it doesn't look right and you know and then what what's the first thing people yeah. want to do they right want to water, they water it more <laughs> right yeah the main reason uh, the master gardener program recommends not pruning in the winter with citrus is because it encourages new growth that that um, may cause it to be susceptible to different types of insects and like um you know we're trying to avoid um having the um leaf miner yeah leaf miner agent citrus psyllid all those different things they they like um any kind of sucking insect likes yeah that that kind of thing. and yeah, then Ed, we do have a question about um citrus and avocado they want to prune and shape it according to size but everywhere they look it says don't prune so i'm not sure what to do well i i mean there was a time when yeah <laughs> there was a time when um i first published backyard orchard culture that um, the University of California at Davis actually, you know, sent some uh, very um, unfavorable um, opinions. Um, and also uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo <laughs> sent some uh, very unfavorable um, um, uh, what comments about our, our recommending, you know, this, this approach to summer pruning. And um, the, at the time, the owner of the nursery, uh, Dave Wilson, uh, Robert Willie said, well, that's fine. You know, we appreciate your opinion, but you know, if, if in fact you haven't tested any of this or you haven't worked through it, then we really don't have a conversation. And that, that, that's ironic in that, you know, a, a lot of now what I'm, you know, what I'm have proposed for years, um, it, like for instance, the Spanish bush technique done at uh, UC Davis really requires a lot of summer pruning. <laughs> so um, the, I, I think that in essence, um, you, when you talk to commercial growers, they're going to tell you, you know, no, that's not the way I would do it. Well, that's, they don't have the, the limitations that you have. And like I said, my son has a 50 foot avocado by the side of his house that nobody bo bothered to pay attention to. And there's no way in the world I'm going to try to bring that thing down. Um, just because I don't know what, um, recapturing an avocado that, that that's that old and that big would do to the tree. So, uh, and, and he gets avocados on it. So he's satisfied, but um, yeah, and and you know, I've I've pretty much pruned everything, and kept it under size control, including including avocados. And I would argue that I've never ever had an issue that actually would challenge whether or not size control is a valid way of, of growing fruit trees in the home garden. And, and actually, his question was really more about encouraging a little more height, which I know is the opposite of what you're. You're doing. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you have advice on that. Well, I mean, encouraging a little bit more height. I mean, there's all kinds of things that come into question then. And that is, you know, is it growing well? I mean, is it healthy? Is it, you know, it does it have, you know, what it needs? Um, I mean, avocados, um, if they're in, you know, a, a good environment with good drainage, they need ideal drainage too, excellent ideal drainage. Um, if they're in an ideal condition, they're not such a slow grower. They, they pretty much grow pretty rapidly. Um, but, you know, I think that a, a lot of that question would have to do with a lot of questions about, you know, what its fundamental exposures are and um, how it's being cared for. Um, you know, I, I think that that would be pretty much the, the only way to approach that. Great. Thanks, Ed. You know what? We, I know a lot of folks have to go and um, we um, had gone over time, unfortunately, because of our technical difficulties. So my apologies. <laughs> and Ed, thank you so much for your patience. Just no, want to right. uh, close off by saying thank you to Ed for speaking with us and um, really great information that helps make fruit trees more accessible for the home gardener. So thank you very much, Ed. My pleasure. And everybody um, have a great holiday. All right. So Ed, um, I'll end the recording there. But um, did you want to answer a question? I, I've seen it multiple times. How big of a pot should you put citrus in? Citrus should never, I mean, there's a lot of people that want to immediately put citrus into a large container because they think, you know, that that, you know, accommodating the large container isn't, it is a, a, a benefit, but it, it isn't. And one of the problems is, is that the citrus doesn't like to have a lot of water accumulated around it at all. And when you've got a big container, 
and you've got no root system growing in that container and it's a small pot, it's gonna take a long time for it to get into that surrounding soil in that pot. And the big problem is, is that those phytophthora that get into the bottom of the soil, they're everywhere. And especially where the, the, the um, moisture isn't moving. Um, and so consequently, the best way to grow a citrus is to, is to grow it in a, a container size. It's probably about two inches bigger than the size that you have it in currently, and then shift it up as you go along. And, and I have no problem. Like if I'm going to, I have, I have citrus in my yard. I have three that have been in the in containers for over 35 years, three of them. And so I never plan on these trees going into the ground. I don't care about whether the root bound, whether the tree is root bound or whatever. All I care about is whether the plant is healthy and it is, and it seems to accommodate the containers and grows just fine. So um, really you wanna stage your, your growth. I mean, stage your shifting till you get it up. I've got these plants that I'm talking about specifically are in 25 inch containers now. And they've been in those containers for roughly about 10 years. So once they get up into those larger containers, they can stay in those containers a long, long time. And if you've ever been to Europe, they're a little bit more daring. Their, their citrus sometimes is in pots smaller than 25 inches. And then some of those citrus are quite old. So. Great. Well, thanks again, Ed. It's my pleasure, Anne. Um, this was a long time coming. I really, I know you do have a lot of videos out there, but uh, one more is always good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. I hope everybody got something out of it. And, you I think know, they did. I see lots of thank you, Ed. Very helpful. Very interesting. I think um, hopefully people will be braver than I am uh, when, or when I was uh, this fall on winter when they get those brand new fruit trees that they just cut it down to, you know, knee height. And I like that recommendation, knee height, because everybody's knee is at a different height. That's so, right. So, you know, right. that'll help pace yourself um, and keep those trees small. Yes, absolutely. All right. Take care, Ed. All right. Thanks, Ann. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.